So this guy's in the restaurant, and he loves the food. And so he asks the waiter, how do you prepare your chicken? The waiter says, nothing special. We just flat out tell them they're going to die. <laughs> So this has got to be my favorite national day that we've had all year. Today is National Men Make Dinner Day. Oh. And I am not kidding. This is observed annually on the first Thursday in November, and it's the day for men to take charge in the kitchen and cook for their loved ones. There is even a website, menmakedinnerday.com. Now, I am not done with this. Just listen up here. Men in here and everywhere need to be made aware that there is a list of official rules that must be followed, and some of them include main meal must include a minimum of four ingredients and requires at least one cooking utensil besides a fork. <laughs> Man goes shopping for all necessary ingredients optimally after doing an inventory of the kitchen so you don't end up with two 64-ounce jars of pickled pimentos. Man may, if desired, turn on the radio or his favorite CD. Man agrees not to be within 30 feet of the TV remote during the cooking process. Now, there are actually 10 official rules I know there are, sorry, there are 12 official rules, and I know some of you will be interested, so I printed off some copies for you to take home so you can abide by the rules. There are even top 10 reasons to participate, one of which is, while cooking, you can still wear your tool belt. Simply replace the hammer with a whisk. So thank you for indulging me in that. I thought it was very important to share. <coughs> Hearst is not here today, so we'll officially start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our invocation today will be given by Ann Palmer. But Irish monks who wrote many of the hymns that we sing had a system of always in all of their prayers talking about what was ahead of them, behind them, to the right, and to their left. And as I was looking for a meditation in the rotary um, files online, I found one that I thought fit. So please join me in a moment of reflection and thanks with these words. With our friends beside us and no person beneath us, with the bonds of rotary between us and our worries behind us, with our goals before us and no task beyond us, with a thirst for knowledge and a dream of a polio-free world, we are thankful for our rotary friends and the meal we are about to share. Thank you, Anne. Um, John Wagner will do our guest introductions today. <coughs> we have a lot of guests, and as is our tradition here at Rotary, I will call the name of the Rotary member, and you will stand with your guest your guests will remain standing until all are introduced, and then we'll applaud for all of them. So, Shelley Robertson, if you would introduce your guest. Uh, John Stoffer, Sr. John, nice to have you here. Sam Karkoff. Uh, I'm going to return to our talk on yesterday, Janelle, my lovely wife, and she's here for the second time in like three weeks, so I think I'll get to be a member. Do the same here, we can be Anyway. Welcome, Janelle. Jim Liker has a guest. 
I'm honored to introduce my guest, Edie Smith. She's our Vice President of Development at Easter Seals Catholic Church. Good. Welcome, Edie. And uh, Carl Watson has a guest. Oh, Mike, Wa Mike Welch has a guest. I'll be a guest. That's all right. <laughs> it's good to see you. It's Carl Watson. And uh, Karen Miller has a guest. I want to introduce for the second time my guest, Tim Royal from Myanmar. He will he is a Southeast Asian fellow through ACYPL and will be a speaker here next week. Tim, all of you were welcome. And I, and I forgot to fill in a, a guest card for my husband. <laughs> oh, and Linda's husband, Mr. Ireland, stand up. You know we love Linda. <laughs> Would you all make a warm welcome, please? <laughs> are here today. Our November featured charity is the Islamic Center of Topeka, and we will be helping to support their center, the center, for their fourth annual Thanksgiving turkey giveaway, and they are able to feed 200 hungry, needy families. The turkeys will be distributed on Saturday, November 18th at Let's Help, and we'll continue the support of this through the month of November. We have several very important announcements today. I'm really excited about this. Uh, first of all, just a heads up, the Soulmates and Covered in Coats distribution will happen in a, in a couple of weeks, so be on the lookout for the details of that, and we'll ask our volunteers to help with it. Um, we have our very exciting Polio Plus announcement, and Sam, if you would make your way up here, and I just want to tell you that you can actually still contribute today. This will be the very last day, either by check or credit card. Good afternoon, my fellow, oh, sorry. Good afternoon, my fellow Rotarians. Before we get started, we have a short uh, Folio Plus video we'd like to show you. So, Linda? dollar math for polio plus contributions in October 
The Gates Foundation offered to double any funds raised in October, and Rotary International offered a 50 cent match for every dollar contributed. So for every dollar we might raise, Polio Plus would receive $4.50. And then shortly thereafter came the word that the match had been raised to $6 for every dollar contributed. And now we are getting serious. On top of that, the Polio Plus money that was raised in October could be applied to Paul Harris Awards, or maybe you took advantage of that. And so this is getting to be a pretty good deal. In our initial planning meeting, I was asked what I thought we should set as a goal for Polio Plus contributions within our club, and I foolishly blurted out $20,000. <coughs> That's what I heard in the room, it's nothing. <laughs> I came up with that figure only because it was what our district was offering on the matching funds, and I thought the sooner we got going on it, the better chance we had of giving, getting all that district money. I don't know how much of it we got, but I think we got uh, uh, quite a bit of it, thanks to uh, all of you. To me, that meeting that we had initially seemed to end rather abruptly, because I knew the campaign was about to begin in a week, and I had no idea what to do. So I started thinking about what uh, what I could do to introduce Polio Plus both to myself and to you all as members. And I made the first announcement that Polio Plus is beginning shortly and there is no bounce for a while. And then a lead gift came in of $1,000. Shortly thereafter, several $500 came and I began to believe it really might happen. Well, I went home that day after uh, my first uh, introduction to you all, Polio Plus, and asked Janelle if she would consider coming to our October meeting to tell you her polio experience, and many of you were here, and she agreed to do so. Thank you, honey. That was a very gracious thing for you to do. Several other club members <laughs> and several other gracious members came forward too. Mike Hall and Kathleen Barker came to tell their stories of polio within their family. Dick Noel, one of our members, came up and shared some history of him and his father, John, starting our close polio plus campaign in, in the late 1980s. And Pat McKayla shared his thoughts a week ago about what Rotary means to him and what each of us could do to achieve our goal. And I want to thank each one of you individually as well. Well, after the first week, we had about $8,000. The second week, about 11000 And the third, nearly 17000 we were getting there, and then I realized I nearly forgot about the Paul Harris match, so we began calling folks within $500 of getting their first one or another level in Paul Harris, and many of them donated as well. Plus, the October cut money went to Polio Plus, which I'm told is a record uh, uh, donation to uh, the cut money for uh, any one month. Within a week or so, I was, beginning, I was thinking through the campaign that even if we did make our goal, to remember that every dollar we gave in our club paid for six polio vaccinations in undeveloped countries. It put doctors, nurses, and volunteers on the ground to deliver them to places we cannot even imagine. It confirms to the Gates Foundation that they made a wise choice to partner with Rotary to eradicate polio right down to the club level. It shows how generous we are as Rotarians with our time, our money, and our commitment to Rotary, its principles and programs, locally and worldwide. It makes number three and number four of our four-way test a real tangible thing. You know the ones about goodwill and better friendships and about beneficial about benefiting people we don't even know. It's a wonderful thing. So before I share with you the, the results of our efforts, I want to thank each and every one of you for making our Polio Plus campaign an unbelievable success. Each of you are incredibly generous individuals in and out of road. So Without further ado, we need a rauscious table drum roll to awaken the polio plus box. There it is. We made on my shoulders because we're a superhero club. Well, I made a unilateral decision that from time to time we will recognize superheroes 
in our club. And Sam, you are our superhero for leading the charge and making this happen. So you get to wear this for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> Turn those cameras off. <laughs> Maybe I should say you have to wear it for this. Stay around. I'll be it over, man. Turn it so they can see what you have on the back. Oh, yeah, sure. So last week I promised that we would only be one week late in announcing our slate of office first for next year, our nomination. So if Grant Glenn will come up, he is the chair of this committee as immediate past president and he gets to make these announcements. Well, I'm, I too am excited today. Uh, we do have a slate. It took us a little while to get together, so because of the uh, meeting schedule, we have put postponed the annual meeting by one week, so that will be in two weeks. So the way the procedure works is we announce the slate today, and next week, if, anybody, if there are any nominations from the floor, they need to be made next week, and then we will have a ballot the following week at our annual meeting. So uh, this year I'm pleased to announce that for the uh, Board of Directors positions, the following people have agreed to serve starting in July, Rayon Reza, Yana Ross, and Jeanette Weeds. Uh, for uh, Sergeant of Arms, Scott McKenzie, Treasurer, Ron Barron, Secretary, Marie Pico, Vice President, Stan Martindale, Joni Underwood is our President-elect, and our President will be Mark DeGroff. This is an outstanding slate, and we're certainly happy that they're going to agree to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Thank you for your work on this. I'm very, very excited about the folks that are going to be leading your club soon. Um, I apologize we got just a little bit behind today, so if we can stay late to hear everything about what we're going to hear today, that would be great. And Vince, if you'll come up and introduce our speakers for today. Can't wait to go back to uh, work and say that I sat next to the Cape Crusader <laughs> for lunch today. So, our speakers, we have two today, and uh, I know both of these guys well. They both serve on the Downtown Topeka Incorporated Board. Uh, our first one I want to introduce is Scott Gales, who you all know because he's a member of this uh, Rotary Club. And Scott, as you all know, uh, is uh, a partner in uh, Architect One, uh, which he joined in 1993 and became a partner in 98. He brings a unique enthusiasm and energy to each design project. I know that because I've worked with him. He has pushed the firm to introduce new technologies and continuously improve their service to clients. And he's very active in the community. I can read a lot of things that he's done, but uh, believe me when I say he's a, been a great asset to this community and continues to be so. Uh, our other speaker uh, is Seth Wagner, and many of you know his brother, Dusty, who is a member of this organization. And Seth is uh, Chief Financial Officer and CEO of AIM Strategies. He was named that in 2015. He's responsible for the financial management of the company and also spearhead, spearhead AIM's operational management and strategic future vision. So prior to that, he was with uh, Colgate Paul Wong, Call, call me Paul. Well, Seth, you tell him who you're with. <laughs> well, that was 13 years. And he brings a unique skill set uh, and diverse background. Uh, so, this is kind of interesting. Uh, Seth's beliefs are, are uh, strongly in managing with respect, paying it forward, and this is something I think we ought to add to the four way test. Uh, believe that. He believes that everyone should strive to become the person that their dog thinks they are. <laughs> He's a KU uh, grad with his MBA and a Washburn grad in political science. I'd like to introduce uh, Seth Wagner and my good friend Scott Gales.
Thank you, Vince. Uh, thank you for having us here. To we're really excited to talk to you guys about everything that we've got going on in uh, downtown Topeka. Um, and I see a lot of familiar faces here. A lot of people that have helped us. Uh, last two years have been a really uh, long road of getting from buying old vacant buildings and now you know we're causing you guys a lot of troubles on Kansas Avenue finding places to park and tripping over contractors and, and everything like that. So um, we are we have a, a great uh, future vision for downtown and Honestly, it, it really starts with uh, our company founder. Um, yeah. Yeah. Our company founder, Cody Foster. Um, I met Cody in college. He was my fraternity brother. He was my uh, roommate uh, my junior year of college. Uh, he wanted a, a big room, and I was an upperclassman. And, Little did I know that uh, you know this relationship would, would be here more than more than twenty years later. Um, as you most as most of you know, um, he uh, started a company in Topeka with David Callahan and Derek Thompson, just the three of them. Now they employ over five hundred people in Topeka. Um, he also started Aim Strategies, which is what I work for has a charitable foundation called the AIM-5 Foundation, which does a lot of uh, great work in the ministry, missionary work overseas, uh, things like that. So I think one of the reasons that he was so focused on downtown is that with Advisors Excel, he's finding it harder and harder to find employees to recruit to Topeka. And, you know, he, his company's played the game of, you know, we'll steal a person here from West Star, or we'll steal a person here from Hills, and you're just rotating talent. And, you know, they bring talent in from outside of the area, and, you know, the thing that really uh, was similar in almost every person that declined a, a job offer with Advisors Excel was that uh, just quality of life, and there's nothing to do here in Topeka. Um, I disagree with that, but uh, um, one of the things that's been kind of the mission with us here at AIM is to improve quality of life, and that's really why we've kind of focused on, on downtown. So all in all, uh, I'll just run through some of the projects that we're doing here, uh, and then Scott can give you kind of some of the details behind each one of the projects. Um, you know, you've seen what's going on with the pocket parks and all the infrastructure improvements in downtown. And uh, the projects that we have going on right now are uh, all said and done, it'll be a little over $35 million in investment in, in downtown Topeka. Uh, we've got everything from restaurants to the hotel to, to loft apartments to office remodel. Um, starting here with the hotel, um, the management team that we have uh, from Chicago is uh, the Aparium Properties Group. Uh, these guys are, uh, the only word I can say to them is the rock stars. They've taught us and Scott so much about hotel management, hotel design, uh, everything like that. Uh, two of their their founder, Mario Triochi, used to be a very uh, high-level executive with uh, Marriott. And you know, Michael Kitchen, who's the one running the project here, is running hotels from the British West Indies and all over the world. So I wanted to show you uh, this property in the across Wisconsin called the Charmont. It is an award-winning property that they have. And I think one of the things that you know, attracted us to them was that they focus on markets like La Crosse, like Topeka. So they understand the dynamic, they understand the story, the downtown revitalization. So um, 
this property is just really amazing. This is their outdoor dining area in La Crosse. Um, it's just, this is something that we're wanting to replicate here in Topeka, just simply from the fact that, uh, you know, we don't want to deliver to you guys what a, a standard hotel is. We want something that Topeka hasn't seen before that is just going to be like, you walk in and you're going to be, wow, this is really something amazing. We want this to be a, a community gathering point. Uh, this is a little lobby area at the, at the Charmant. And like I said, uh, uh, these guys have really embraced the history of Topeka, embraced the history of Cyrus K. Holiday and, and how they've designed this property. There's going to be a lot of things where you go and go in and look at it and, you know, it's going to make you very proud of Topeka. Thank you, Seth. So, to lay the groundwork here, we're going to kind of give you a little insight on what all was transpiring over the last decade as the downtown started becoming a focus. I had the good fortune, working with our, being the president of Architect One, architect that we were working with, um, a lot of people that were very passionate about redeveloping downtown. Several of them are in here, Vince Fry and William Batetta and Karen Heller and many others, and there are quite a few across town that come together in the last decade, and, and there was a determination that things were going to happen. It was in the middle of that that we were having some good fortune with our firm. We were growing, and properties we owned, we had tenants that were growing, and they needed space, so our space became expendable. And in 1993, we were really seriously thinking about moving our firm back downtown, which is where it was when I joined my business partner, Mike Wilson, in 1993. We just happened to be in the fourth floor of the old Columbian Title Trust Building, which is now a bus depot. So uh, going, coming full circle, we happened to come across this property, which is the, the old Shawnee Federal Savings and Loan. This is how it looked in 1993. It had been vacant for nearly 13 years. The roof had leaked for most of that, and when you walked in there, the mold was deep enough that you probably would have confused it as a mushroom barn. Uh, in fact, our insurance, our uh, real estate agent was a lot smarter than us, and he, uh, he uh, stayed outside, and uh, we found out why. Because after we were done touring, it's kind of like uh, guys that are on a hog farm, you know, uh, smell of money. Well, in his mind, he's thinking, ah, this is a closed deal, they're going to buy it, but I'm not going in. And uh, we had to go home and change clothes because the smell was so bad. And we're talking about the middle of January. So we bought this property. We closed on it in March. And uh, in June, we moved in and had renovated it completely top and bottom, 10,000 square feet total. It just so happened a year later, um, the misfortune experienced by HHB ended up being good fortune for downtown Topeka because while they lost their business um, down in the 700 block, they elected to stay downtown and our lower level was vacant. Uh, we had taken the entire upper floor and so HHB Barbecue moved into the lower level and uh, I have not gained one pound from the smell, but I have eaten there quite frankly, which has uh, considered, uh, contributed considerably to my uh, my uh, stature, I wish I could play football this week. So, um, working, it was in this process that we were downtown that we had the opportunity to meet Cody and Seth, and they came to us and they were looking at the hotel project, and in the middle of that, they had some other projects that they felt they needed to contribute to in order to support the hotel projects. So, one of the things that was very important to us uh, strategically is we invested in downtown Topeka and the properties around the hotel was uh, we really wanted to try to control the value, control the value of the properties around it. Uh, you know, the last thing you want to do is build a, a five-star hotel and then across the street have somebody open a payday loan store. Um, so we were able to purchase, you know, three uh, properties across the street uh, from the hotel. Uh, the 913 property is the old uh, merchant building. Uh, it is a very unique property. It's very uh, beautiful inside. It, uh, we did have a fire there, as you know, in uh, December of 2016. And, uh, but luckily the damage was uh, very minimal in there. Uh, we're really excited. Uh, this project is actually going to be done uh, tomorrow. Um, we're building a loft apartment in the upstairs, and I think a lot of you 
have seen that that Argyle facade that I just showed you on the previous slide is no longer there. And we've, we've opened it up to this original facade uh, that's there now. Um, and it was actually quite interesting when we took that facade off, what we found underneath it was the sign for the Foster Humane Society, which made my boss extremely happy. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, I hope that uh, some of you will uh, be able to come out um, on the loft tour that's uh, being offered this weekend to, to take a look at the property and, uh, you know, I think you'll be really excited about, you know, what downtown living can, can be like. Um, you know, um, it's definitely a down whole downtown revitalization is a multi-pronged approach with living space, entertainment, uh, probably the last thing's retail. We're just trying to touch on a little bit of everything in what we're doing. Uh, this is a uh, rendering that Scott's team did about uh, what the interior of the apartment's going to look like, and I'll turn it over to him. We'll just go through these quickly because we have a lot to show you. But uh, we took a photo over here on the left that shows you progress. So this was after the renovations had started. But we early on had worked up a concept. Um, we wanted them to be able to share prospective tenants, how it might, uh, the experience of living there could, could be, and kind of give them a little bit of a vision. So the lower right-hand image is not a photograph. It is a rendering so that uh, people could get that reality of what living in a loft in the downtown could feel like. So likewise, we stood in the kitchen and did the same thing, taking a photograph, looking out at what will be the hotel when it's completed. And so the left hand is the rendering, or the, excuse me, photograph of the, of the loft that is uh, about mostly complete. The finishes haven't been totally done and the furniture's not in, but the lower right is what it might look like if it's being lived in, so. So personally, this is my favorite project that, uh, that we're working on. This uh, building at 915 South Kansas Avenue had been vacant since 2004. We bought it, I believe the, there was a credit bureau in this building. So um, the thing that's very unique about uh, this building is it's very hard to find buildings of this size in a downtown area. And this building is three floors of 7,500 square feet. Um, so this project right here is going to be called The Pennant. Uh, back in the 1940s, um, this building was the Pennant Cafe on the upper floor, and on the lower floor was the Jenkins Music Company. There still is some signage in, in the interior of the building for Jenkins that we are going to preserve. Uh, so, but this building is going to become a bowling alley, restaurant, sports bar, beer garden, and retro arcade. So it's going to be a little bit of uh, something for, for everybody here. Um, you know, this is a rendering of what it's going to look like uh, finish-wise. We really uh, think that it will offer some very unique um, food uh, for uh, downtown Topeka and the Topeka community in general. I don't want to give away everything, but... Uh, I don't want to give away everything that we're going to be serving here, but, uh, you know, uh, really excited for this. This is going to be close to, uh, uh, I think, two and a half million dollar investment in downtown Topeka for us. This is just a little bit of a rendering of the upstairs uh, in that front space uh, that you'll see uh, can be segregated off and that's going to be the beer garden where you know, it's going to be a little bit quieter where you can go on a date or have a group there. And this is kind of the upstairs rendering uh, of the sports bar area. This building right here, as most of you know, the Columbian building is probably the uh, favorite building that we've acquired uh, since I've been with AIM. It is absolutely beautiful inside. If you haven't been inside of it before, 
just stop by and, and walk through it. Uh, you know, it was built in the 1880s. Uh, it still has the old manual elevator inside of it, and the guy that runs the elevator. Uh, you know, we have started on this building, and when we got it, it was in pretty sad shape. It, it needed about $50,000 worth of waterproofing because it was just, uh, every time it rained, it was just a mess in, in certain areas in the building. Uh, we've gone through and done some pretty major renovations on the third floor and fourth floor now uh, to put some modern office space uh, in there. Uh, this is just going to be kind of a, um, you know, a slow floor by floor getting the building up to speed and up to code. But, you know, the, uh, the crown jewel of what we're doing in the Columbia building is going to be the, the white linen restaurant. And I know you guys have probably seen that in, in the paper and everything. That is under construction right now. Um, Chef Van Dong, who used to run the drum room up in Holton, Kansas, is coming down to run this. I think this is going to be somewhat of a culinary experience that Topeka has really never seen before. It's going to be a reservation only, um, very uh, high quality, you know, fine dining experience for all of you. And I'll let Scott just talk about how we're going to utilize the vaults and different things like that within the restaurant. I feel like the play-by-play -play guy on a dodgeball tournament or something. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I think and the only thing I just might add on this is this is an exciting building because it's it's one of those historical fabrics in our downtown that that um, you know for 20 years people have looked at and said how do we make this work and it takes a little bit of reinvestment that had been turned into a, 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 a registered landmark through the National Historic Landmark process about 25 years ago but it was very worn it was very tired and there was quite a bit of it that was underutilized and, Using their vision and a little bit of their pocketbook, we've been able to kind of come back with new eyes and freshen it up. And I think and Seth is right. This restaurant on the first floor, inside the old uh, vault space for the title company, and as you can see here um, in the in the back, right here, you'll be able to see the old vault doors and all of the vaults are all of the the boxes and everything are still in there. So all that will be part of the experience. And the kitchen area will be right up here, part of the presence of eating there. They'll be seating for around 30, 30 plus. But it's meant to be really intimate. It's white linen. You know, you're, you go there expecting something a little top notch, and it's adding to that character downtown. I mean, we, we we want all the above. We want everything, and this is one of those everything items that we want the experience to be downtown. And it's only three blocks from the hotel, which again adds to supporting the long term sustainability of the hotel. So as many of you see, this is the, the shell of the Cyrus that you, that you see now. Um, the 912 space on, on the left is going to be our, our banquet space. Um, and then between that is going to be a courtyard and, and the, the tower that's going up there. Uh, you know, we were really disappointed uh, that we weren't able to, you know, fully utilize the old 920 building. Um, it's just that when we got in and started doing a lot of the, the demolition there, the structure of the building, it, it had taken so much damage in like the 66 tornado and some of the other things, it just wasn't viable for yeah. us to keep. But you know, for this property, we're doing as much as we possibly can to you know, embrace the history of, of what was there. You can see this was the original, um, you know, area from 920 down to, to 912 there. Uh, we are going to try to restore that 920 building to be look very much like it was. You know, the, the Landmarks Commission and the historical standards won't let us uh, restore it to exactly like it is, but we can get 95% of the way there, and that's our goal. Just a little overview of, uh, you know, the 900 block. Scott was, was talking about, and I'll let him talk about, you know, what investment in downtown has done to this block. So this is just a little bit of education for you on economic development and the return on your investment. 
I mentioned to your architect one that moved into the downtown about four years ago, and, and I just want to emphasize our office is right here. In, in the time period, in the last 10 years, we have been involved in downtown in numerous projects. It just so happened several of them were on this block. Um, not only were we investors in this building here at 900 Kansas City, which many of you may remember as the, uh, the building that Thompson Crawley had a furniture store on the first floor, and the, and the third, second, third, and fourth floors were all blocked in. It is now fully occupied. Um, in fact, we like to say it's 105% of its original performance because we weren't factoring in square footage in the basement when we renovated the building. But it's now in the National Historic Register. You can see there's a placard on the front of the building, fully operational. By the way, that building you could buy for about $400,000 about, about seven years ago. Now it's an appraised, well, a business person wouldn't tell you what it's truly appraised it, but the investment was $5 million in this thing, and it's worth far more than that now, fully leased. Um, back here in the corner of this little white box, you might remember that as the old um, AC Sporting Goods, right? Well, they closed their business a few years ago, and Zimmerman and Zimmerman Law Firm moved in there. They spent about a half million dollars, and when ACs was in there, it was a pretty tired building. In fact, about half of it wasn't being used, utilized other than maybe to store shoes that were 20 years old. So after they moved out, Zimmerman, Zimmerman spent an investment. They pretty much have doubled the value of the building. So it's an amazing building. If you've never been in, you should go and see everything they've done. Um, right behind there is the Coronado parking garage. At one point, we had an offer to buy that from the city for a million dollars. And they were prepared to sell it because they could only keep it half full. Well, with the hotel, it's going to be full. It's a cash revenue for it. I think they probably sell it for considerably more than that now. But to replace that parking garage in today's dollars would be about seven and a half million bucks. So that's what the true asset value is there for 250 parking stalls. Many of you remember this as the old Department of Education building. Well, actually, it was the Scott Puffer Chevrolet building built in the late 20s. And after it was damaged severely in the tornado in the 60s, Department of Education moved in there. They had built the third floor on top of it. It was built that solid. You could just come in and add another story, which is unheard of in today's day and age. Well, when the Department of Ed said, you know, you haven't done anything for 50 years, we're moving out, the Scott family was distraught. They couldn't sell the building for $500,000, no takers. So they, in negotiating with uh, realtors and people from the state, they basically told them, look, if you do certain improvements, we will reconsider it. Now the Department of Revenue was in there after they um, renovated it to the tune of $5 million. That's a 50,000 square foot building. So $5 million to renovate 50,000 square feet. Think about that a little bit, doing the math. But the resale value of that now is about double that. Okay? We have a client that owns this lot, Martin Spees. He's not in a big hurry right now, and I wouldn't be either if I were him, okay? That's a very popular corner now. And we have this client that came along. Those three or four buildings right there, if I would have tried to buy them all, I probably could have got the whole package for about $700,000, all of them. Um, and there was about five buildings uh, about five years ago. And I, I'm not even gonna guess what uh, kind of deal Seth was able to get. But the hotel reinvestment downtown is gonna be about $25 million. So seven years ago, I probably could have bought this entire block, the entire block, if I had cash in my hand for probably six to seven million dollars. When this project is done, not including what might happen right there, you're going to see about 45 to 48 million dollars in reinvestment on one block in downtown. Now that is a return on your money, and I would add that most of that can be contributed to the fact that the city decided to collaborate with private sector to redo the downtown. And that gave people the confidence that it was okay to reinvest in the downtown, which is why we're here talking with Seth and his partners today. These last few slides are just some renderings of uh, you know what the hotel is going to look like. It is going to have this is something publicly that we haven't really shown to people before, but. The patio dining on the the, the uh, south side of the hotel, right next to Marvin Spees' property, and I think it's going to be um, something that uh, is going to be very welcome downtown Topeka. The Aquarium guys are very much known for their food and beverage operations. Have been to several of their restaurants in Milwaukee and Detroit and some areas, and they will do they will do well by Topeka. Here's a night view of the Cyrus. Um, Really, one of the main things that uh, you know wanted Scott to keep was the amount of glazing on the building. I want that um, that to 
be seen at night for the windows to play a good part in the design and, and the beauty of the building and really be something that you know draws people to downtown Topeka. Uh, I'll let Scott run through the floor plan because this is what we paid him for. <laughs> Little color commentary. This just real quickly, uh, the uh, the building that we refer to as 920 or 918. Um, these are new ground up buildings now, replacing the original buildings that were here. But the main entry will be right here. We do have a, a main lobby area, and there'll be a little courtyard commons here. And then the old building that you see that we've kept, the three story building, is just to your left. So uh, the little outdoor seating area that Seth was referring to is over here. This is the new uh, Main Street kind of, you'll, this is the sidewalk down here. You'll be able to see the bar when you walk by. And it has a real nice kind of curbside of appeal to it. And that, you know, as you walk by a neighborhood bar right next to the lobby, you come in there and sit, and it has that kind of, uh, it can, it's small enough and quaint enough it'll look busy all day long with just a half dozen or a dozen people in there. But as the evening comes on, we have the back bar area here that doubles the size of the bar. Um, and then this can serve as our coffee bar in the morning, but the whole bar then can be a hub of activity in large, larger crowds in the evening. So the, the look of the bar is going to have this kind of feel, kind of very traditional, kind of uh, capitalizing on kind of the Federalist style and kind of rich traditional style of the railroad days, but very modern in the materials, just kind of maybe some kind of the classic feel that you might um, expect if you had say 100 years ago dressed up in your suit and your evening attire and wanted to go somewhere, that's the effect that we're wanting to try and have with the overall feel of the hotel. Um, the back part of the hotel um, bar restaurant area is this long area here that, that uh, fronts the, uh, bear with me a second here. It's not my uh, laptop, so I'm gonna look around it. Thank you. Just want to emphasize this. Uh, this is our dining area. This is for our main dining, and then we have a little kind of a banquette uh, breakout room. Um, the back kitchen area will be over here, and then we have a big event room over here that'll seat up to 250, 300 people, depending on the function. So the dining area altogether between 100, 120 people on a busy night. We don't want it to be over oversized, and we have it in waves, as you notice, with the front bar the back bar and then the dining area so that as the evening grows or the crowd grows we can add layers of space to make it feel busy so it doesn't feel expansive because we spread everybody out but just to give you a little feel of the character and the charm obviously the south wall opens out to that outdoor patio and we have real nice seating and, and uh, kind of uh, using rich woods and, uh, and the deeper colors of paint on the walls kind of adding a little character so the one thing we want to do here is give you a little bit of a taste of not going to happen. We have a video here, and for some reason, it, we're going to play it real quick, just so you can experience the hotel. Let me see if it'll pull up for us. Everybody's slideshow machine is a little bit different, so there we go. I'm going to bring it alive. And if you're confused, this is not a real film. This is just a three-dimensional com computer-generated graphic. So. The stone that you see behind where it says Cyrus Hotel is the original stone from the uh, orphanage that was in the building. Uh, it used to actually have some emblems on it that were destroyed over the years. We, we carefully took that stone out and we'll be putting it back into the new facade. So there's some historical elements that we wanted to tie back. So this, the, the fun thing about this video is we kind of put it together to show you the hotel over the course of the day. So the first flyby was a an afternoon, this is the evening, and then we'll give you a little bit of night feel. You'll notice the little courtyard right there so you can walk off the street, smaller events. We're very excited about how we've been able to maintain this old three-story building here. We call this area right off the street the gallery. 
It's a smaller space so we can have functions like First Friday events where you can walk in off the street without having to go through the lobby. Um, you know, events that can host 50 to 100 people in there, art shows, etc. cetera, um, live music, a bar, whatever. And without opening up the entire hotel, they can create a kind of curbside presence for the hotel. And yes, this is Architect One, but uh, we usually stay there and sleep at our desk, so we won't be staying at the hotel, plus Seth gives me a key, so. So uh, here's just a little bit of a feel of walking into the little small courtyard space between the event room on the left and the lobby on the right. Um, small enough that it gives you a little feel. And so uh, in talking with Seth, we wanted to give a little bit of an Easter egg on the video. So we, uh, we have a little add-on that we put in here just to show you what it's going to be on every night for him after work. So it's the life of being a, an investment company. So this is our third floor, third floor suite. It opens out onto the roof deck, and uh, and the deck is, allows you to watch the street from below for parades and other events. And uh, it really gives us that setback from the tower from the street, kind of that that pedestrian scale to the buildings without being an eight-story building right up on the sidewalk. So anyway, um, with that, that's our presentation. We appreciate the. Uh, the time and uh, we'll stand for any questions if you'll give us a few minutes. I'm going to stay for a couple of questions. If you need to leave, go ahead, but this is such a valuable uh, presentation, so we'll wrap it up shortly. Maybe two questions. Fun.